everybody, this is Tracy here with another edition of A View from Tracy's Point, and we are here to recap Shots Fired Season 1, Episode 3, which was titled Somebody's Son. The show opens with Ash and Preston, and they're going to visit um, Corey's dad to ask if he has seen him, because remember, um, Corey hasn't been seen since he was running from those goons a couple of episodes ago. And so Ash asks if he filed a um, missing persons report and he lets them know that he didn't because in the past when him and Corey had like a disagreement or falling out, that Corey always went to stay at his sister's house and then, you know, once things calmed down, he would come back. So while they are talking to the dad, they hear shots fired in the distance. So then we have a scene uh, where Deputy Brooks and looks like um, Lieutenant Breland arrive at the scene of the shooting. And so they are investigating and Lieutenant Breland is like coaching Brooks. So I'm thinking that he must be a rookie. And so he's coaching him on, you know, how not to get himself, you know, shot and that he needs to pay attention. So then they find the body of a young black teen that they say is probably around 17 years old and he is, you know, shot, shot multiple times and he has died. So Ash um, arrives on the scene and then her and Breland have like a brief exchange because she feels that he's being insensitive to the dead teen and says that he's somebody's child. And then um, Breland responds that, and he's sure that whoever killed him was another black person. So, you know, kind of like that argument that more blacks get killed by black people, so we shouldn't care when um, white police officers kill them. Over at the pool hall where all the um, police officers gather, Deputy Brooks is asked about Deputy Beck by a retired police officer, some guy who served like 30 years on the force, and he is offended that the department filled his spot with the likes of Beck. And so the guy pulls out a petition and he's asking everybody in the room to sign the petition, and it is a petition to have um, Deputy Beck suspended or fired. So Brooke refuses to sign the petition and Breland has to step in, you know, between him and the guy. And then a little scuffle ensued and I can't remember if he punched the guy or if he just pushed him over, but anyway, the guy ends up leaving. So over at the Beck's house, Carrie is trying to get the kids in the car, but things are really stressful, you know, with the media camped out in the front yard. And then one of the kids goes back in the house to get something. So she goes towards the house and Joshua comes out. And so he tells her that he's not going with them wherever they were planning to go. And instead, you know, he puts on his earbuds and goes for a run and tells her that he will catch up with her later. Ash gets a call that she can talk to her daughter, Kai, so she's really excited. And the caller tells her to be prepared, you know, for the call to come in at around two o'clock. So she and Preston go to visit Pastor Janae and Ash brings up the rumor that they heard about Joy Campbell and Pastor Janae suddenly, you know, tempers her socially conscious rhetoric that she was spewing on them and when they ask about Corey she becomes a little concerned that they are learning too much about her dealings and you know not focusing on you know what she wants them to focus on so a politician by the name of Penn Motor, you know, he shows up at the car home and he tells Alicia that he is going to introduce a bill called the Jesse Carr Call First Bill or something like that, which would be a law where if a police officer stops someone that's 21 or younger, that before they can proceed with the stop, that they will call a parent or a guardian. And I'm thinking... How is that going to help? <laughs> because, like, first of all, what is the parent? Like, are they going to sit there and wait for the parent or guardian to show up? But we know that's not going to help any black person because before they even get to the point where they ask the black person what their name is or for identification or the parent's phone number, um, those police officers would have shot and killed them anyway. Alicia is offended that he wants to use her son's death for his political platform and refuses to throw her support behind the idea. So after Mulder um, leaves her house, he goes down to the sidewalk where he's interviewed by a reporter. The toxicology report shows that Jesse Carr's blood le alcohol level was 0.8, but that there was no marijuana in his system. 
Ash and Preston called the parents in and asked how long um, Jesse had struggled with alcoholism. And so Alicia says that he didn't have a problem, but Ash brings up the fact that he had been in rehab before. And so she lets um, Ash know that there was an incident where him and a friend were caught drinking. And so she sent him to rehab as sort of like a precaution to let him know that, you know, this isn't the life that he wants for himself. And so when asked why they would send him to rehab after only one incident, the dad acknowledges that he is a recovering alcoholic. He also shares that Jesse called him a week earlier, you know, before he was shot and killed, and he was looking for advice because something had happened on the college campus. And then Alicia also, you know, shares that Jess, the car that Jesse was driving was his high school graduation gift, you know, and that they were proud of him for graduating and being accepted into college. So Alicia wants to know um, if Jesse was pulled over for drunk driving the day that he was killed. And when Ash says no, Alicia accuses her of trying to come up with a story to make Jesse look bad. Sound familiar? And so she also wants to know when she uh, would be able to get Jesse's car out of impound. So Pastor Janae and Governor Emmons, you know, they are having lunch together. And Pastor Janae says that she called the governor because she would listen to what she had to say. And so she tells the governor that in her election speech, she said that she was a champion for the upper class and middle class, but what about the lower class? And so there are numerous people, you know, looking through the window of the restaurant, and it seems to be really annoying um, Emmons. So the scene goes to Alicia arriving at Mulder's campaign headquarters and when he comes out to greet her, she lets him know that she's had a change of heart and that she's in and ready to support him. So Ash goes to see Alicia and is surprised that there are cameras and makeup artists at the house. And she came to give her the um, release for Jesse's car, but Alicia lets her know that she is no longer that she no longer believes Ash is there to seek justice in Jesse's death. And that, you know, I guess she's upset because her attention is also focused on the Joey Campbell boy. And then she's upset, you know, that they brought up the whole thing about the alcohol. So when someone calls um, for her, Alicia goes before the camera and begins reciting a statement about the Jesse Carr bill and how um, Penn Motor is the best candidate for mothers and will ensure that police are held accountable regardless of race when it comes to police shootings. Governor Emmons goes to see Shamika Campbell, you know, after talking to Pastor Janae, and she's accompanied by her aide, um, Sarah. And so she meets Shamika's um, youngest son, Sean, and he's a very mannerable little boy and he offers his guests a choice of tea and lemonade and he's dressed I think he had on like a shirt and a tie and everything so they are in the bedroom that Joy and Sean shared and Emmons looks around and notices that there's tape on the floor so Shamika you know she's kind of embarrassed and then she explains that the reason the tape is there is because Joy is because Joy used to bounce the basketball in that spot all the time and that, you know, after he was killed, she decided to keep the tape there, you know, it's sort of like a remembrance to him. So Sean is asking the governor a lot of questions, letting her know that he is a smart kid. And in return, she asks him about the Hornets basketball team. So Sean lets her know that uh, basketball was Joy's thing and not his. The governor decides that she's been there long enough and says that she has to leave. But before she goes, Shamika asks if she can help get Sean into a better school because the one he's in is closing down. So the governor says that she will see what she can do, you know, but she can't make any promises. And then when she shakes um, Sean's hand, she tells him that he has a very good handshake. So I guess the whole thing with Pastor Janae bringing her there to meet Shamika was to see if the governor had any kind of influence in order to get Sean into another school. So Ash and Preston go to talk to um, Cara, who was Jesse's girlfriend, and she shares that Jesse started drinking after pledging a fraternity and that he became intoxicated one night and got into an altercation with the um, resident assistant. So Ash goes to talk to the RA and he tells them that Jesse got drunk just one time, but it was one time too many. And when she asks him to tell her what happened, he says that he's not a snitch. And so Ash says that if she had a dollar for every time somebody said that they weren't a snitch right before 
uh, they snitched <laughs> that she would be a very rich woman. The guy tells her that Jesse was quote unquote white boy wasted and that they got into a fight and that he had to beat Jesse's ass, another quote. <laughs> so Ash asks if it was in front of his frat brothers and he replies, no, it was in front of everybody. So at the storyboard, Preston and Ash debate whether or not Jesse was a racist and Ash receives a call that a friend tracked um, Kiana's cell phone um, down. And so you remember Kiana was the girl who uh, witnessed Joey Campbell being murdered and then all of a sudden she just piped up and moved and disappeared. Preston is worried that Ash used illegal means to find Kiana. So the two are bickering about college and frats when Preston tells um, Ash that he is actually a Sigma. And so Ash is shocked, you know, that he is a frat boy. And Preston then tells her, you know, how many politicians, judges, presidents, you know, all these people, prominent people that are actually Sigmas. And he tells her that they are 50 uh, within the Department of Justice. Ash goes to visit um, Kiana, who actually lives in another city now, and she is set up in a really nice townhouse and is fully furnished, and she has a whole bunch of shopping bags all over the place, so whoever is responsible for her moving, they um, obviously have a lot of money and wanted to keep her away so that she couldn't testify. So outside, someone is listening to their conversation. So I don't know if it's a police officer or what's going on because we never did see the person again. The next day on her drive back, Ash calls Preston to fill him in. When they disconnect, she gets a call that Javier forgot about, you know, the call that he was supposed to make with Kai and that it'll probably be two to three hours later before they can make the connection again because Kai isn't available. So Preston goes to the frat house to inquire about um, Jesse's plans on the day he was killed. And the guy who comes to the door says that Jesse was on his way to Gates Barbecue. And so, you know, Gates Barbecue is a famous barbecue place. So good shout out to Gates. And so Preston states that was a long drive for some barbecue, but the frat brother says that was what he wanted. So Lieutenant Breland goes to visit Shamika at the request of the governor and he apologizes for the way he came across the first time that he visited because remember he came and threatened Shamika that she better not talk to the police about Joey's death and he says that he means well and wants to be the first person she calls if she hears anything about her son's murder. Back at the college, Preston attends a party and engages with one of the um, fraternity pledges and the kid lets Preston know that after Jesse was beaten, the frat brothers started harassing him, saying it was an embarrassment for him to get beat up by a black guy. So Beck finally returns home and it is dinner time. Well, actually it's after dinner time because his food is on the table and then he looks over and Carrie is under the kitchen sink trying to fix a leak in the pipes. So Joshua asks Carrie, you know, why didn't she call the plumber? Because it was the same leak that he had came and fixed a couple of weeks earlier. And she lets him know that she did call, but the plumber refused to come. So Beck believes that it's because he is the black cop that killed the white guy. So Carrie says they're already getting the side eye by everyone else, so they can't be doing it to each other. And then Joshua implies that she isn't the one that's being looked at sideways. And Carrie, you know, she begs to differ and tells him that she, when she had went to do the fitting for the bridesmaid's dress, that she was told, well, not in, um, straightforward terms but it was suggested that if she was under a lot of stress because of the shooting that they would understand if she dropped out of the wedding and so she tells him that you know even though she was offended she wasn't dropping out of the wedding and that she was going to force the bride to come to her and you know be woman enough to tell her herself that she's no longer welcomed in the wedding party so she assures Joshua that they can get through anything together but they can't you know turn on each other and begin to fight one another. Ash goes to the um, sheriff's office to ask where she should turn in the paperwork for Jesse's car and without ever making eye contact, the deputy tells her it goes, in, it goes over to the impound lot. So as she walks away, she overhears an officer speaking to Corey's dad and he is there filing a missing persons report. So I guess she puts it together that he knows where uh, Corey is, and if she hadn't, you know, mentioned about him 
filling the missing person's report that he never would have did it. And so he's there to cover his tracks. So later Ash tells him as he leaves the house and her daughter calls and begins to tell her about Paula taking her, you know, shoe shopping. Hearing this strikes a nerve with Ash and she goes off on Kai without even realizing it. And she starts yelling at her for speaking Spanish and for missing um, having the opportunity to talk to her earlier because she had went shoe shopping. So Kai begins to cry and Javier gets on the phone, but then he ends up hanging up on Ash and blocking her phone number so she can't call back. So Preston is at the batting cage when Sarah shows up and he shares with her that he may have placed Corey's life in danger, you know, by involving him in the investigation. And then for some reason, um, Sarah decides to reveal that when she was in college at Duke, she learned that a frat had, that a fraternity had a slut book. And so she organized the slut walk and got the fraternity shut down. And the event um, got the attention of the governor's office and earned her an internship. And that's how she got her job. And then Preston jokingly asked her if her name was in the slut book. And then, you know, I don't know if she ever said no, but I know they started laughing about it. So Jesse's car is delivered and the scene goes to Joshua and Carrie in the shower. And then it goes back to Alicia and she gets in the car and begins to cry. So Ash has followed um, Corey's dad to a gas station and when he leaves, he heads over to an apartment complex. So Ash goes up into the apartment and it's dark inside and when she goes in, she's jumped by a guy and so they get to fighting and tussling and when she finally gets him pinned down on the ground, she realizes that it was Corey. That was it guys, another great episode and the show is just, it just keeps getting better week after week. Leave your comments below, rate the video and subscribe to the channel and I will check with you guys later. Take care. Bye-bye.